thing about doing something for the first time is that you're not going to do it very well. That's the whole point about something being the first time. I don't care whether it's shooting a basket or swimming or asking a girl out on a date. It just doesn't come all that easily. So first time students at UT are not going to do this first day of class very well just because they've never done it before. The problem with that though is that being able to do the first day of class well goes a long way in the long run to being a really good student because there are things that happen that first day that you're never going to get back if you don't do them right. What I would prefer is that every student be nervous, every student be anxious, every student wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning wondering, all right, am I going to be able to get this right? Because really, when that first day starts, think about the things you have to do. You have to figure out ways without your parents around to help to eat and groom yourself and get to your classes and make it all work on this gigantic campus we're on. So if you think it's easy to be living in an apartment on 38th Street and somehow end up in some building with three letters associated with it you've never heard on the fourth floor in 1.32 at some odd time like 9.30, well, it doesn't come just like that. You know, on that first day, as you stand outside in the hall waiting for class to start, and you look around at these other people, these aren't just random people standing around you. These are the people who are going to be your classmates. They're going to take your same tests as you. They're going to turn in the same homeworks as you. They're going to stay up all night the same as you on exactly the same night. The better you can and the more quickly you can get to know these folks, the better off it's going to be in the long run for you. So, so when does this happen? Does this happen when you're standing out there in the hallway before classes start and you walk up and smile at somebody and say hello and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Does it happen when you walk in and you sit down for class and you look at the person sitting to the left or the right or in front or behind you and say hello and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Because you know the thing that you have to appreciate is that being able to get a good grade in a class so often depends upon the relationship you have not just with the teacher, but also with the other students. I made the mistake when I was going to college to pretty much do everything on my own. And I worked hard, and I studied hard, and I was smart. But darn if there weren't always things that popped up on the test that I didn't get right when everybody else did. And it had nothing to do with how smart I was. It had to do with the fact that because I was a loner, because I didn't take advantage of the group knowledge that just sort of floated above the class, that everybody else knew, I wasn't able to take advantage of it and I wasn't able to be successful. Now when you walk in and you sit down and you take a look at that professor for the first time, there are all these things that are going to go through your head. Um, and a lot of it, because you are afraid, is to think all these intimidating things about this person. About how smart they must be, about how funny looking they must be, about how off-putting they seem to be in their personality type and in their demeanor. You have to put all of this aside and appreciate the fact that that individual standing up there isn't any different than your second grade teacher or your 11th grade teacher. They're just a person who's there because they've made the decision that in their life they want to be a teacher. And part of that means being able to establish a relationship with you. 90% of the inability of students to develop relationships with the faculty is on the student. It is not on the professor. I was um, certainly socially inept when I was in college, and I think that you can chalk up my first year of college to being one of the most pathetic social experiences in the history of the world. I was the kind of guy who raced to the dining hall to get there when it opened, ate as fast as possible, and raced back to my dorm room as quickly as I could so I could avoid not having anybody to sit with. Um, I was the kind of person who, on the weekends, just sort of sat in my room. There was no internet, there was no television, I just sort of sat in my room not studying because I didn't know what to do. Yet, by my sophomore year, I had actually found the group of people that I wanted to interact with. It turned out that I wasn't into drinking and I wasn't into going out to parties and all. Um, I was the kind of guy who, well, this is kind of embarrassing, 
What I did on Saturday nights in my sophomore year was to go over to a girls' dormitory and sit around with a bunch of goody two-shoes girls playing spoons. This is kind of card game. But they liked me, and I liked them, and I sure enjoyed the heck out of playing spoons with them. And it was in that environment that I ultimately met the first girlfriend I ever had and actually became happy in college. Now, if somebody had said to me as I was starting college, don't worry, David, it's going to happen. It's going to be the beginning of your sophomore year, and it's going to be playing spoons in a girl's dormitory that's going to set you on the path to being um, a student in college who feels comfortable, who feels like he's part of things. I would have thought, that's disgusting. And yet, it turned out to be the case for me. I meet kids all the time who feel awkward, who feel out of place, who feel like they don't fit. And boy, do I understand them. Boy, do I resonate with them. But what I tell them is you have to try. You have to put yourself in the middle of things. You have to have those uncomfortable experiences and then walk away from them. Because you're going to find those people. That's what's so wonderful about a large university like this, is you're going to find those people who are right for you. When you walk into a class on the first day and you sit down and you listen to somebody talk to you, chances are it's going to be over your head. Chances are it's going to be a college level class, a college level class in medieval literature, a college level class in quantum mechanics, a college level class, and all kinds of stuff that's difficult for you to follow. Your immediate response will probably be to say, that's boring. I don't like that. And people say that not because the subject actually is boring, but rather because they haven't invested the time and the right attitude into trying to learn the material. If you can turn your attitude around and make it a positive one and say, you know, I am legitimately going to listen to what this person has to say, and I'm going to struggle and fight to find interest in it, and use that positiveness in the way you approach the material, then it may take a couple of days. But there's going to be a point where it clicks for the first time and you get it. And you're going to go, you know, you know that biology isn't so bad after all. I think I kind of like it. I remember um, when I was a junior in college, and by the way, as I give you all of this advice, do appreciate that I was the worst student in the world, and that the only reason I know everything I'm telling you right now is because I spent an enormous amount of time doing it wrong, screwing up, and then going, wow, no wonder I flunked out. So I'm walking through the third floor of this um, library, um, somewhere in my uh, third year at uh, my undergraduate school, and I see my girlfriend's roommate sitting in a little study carol at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. Now, at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday, I was typically drinking coffee, throwing a Frisbee, falling asleep on a couch somewhere. This young woman actually was in a carol doing something, so I thought I'd ask her. I said, are you studying for a test? And she said, no, I am rereading my notes from class. What? I said. She said, yeah, always before the very next class I have, I reread the notes so I can be fresh about what was talked about last time. It makes it easier for me to be prepared for the next lecture. She says this to me, and I'm utterly stunned. I think, first of all, do such human beings exist? And evidently they did. There she was. And uh, I said, uh, wow. Um, so why is this a good thing? And she said, well, actually, it makes being in college really easy. I said, really? College is easy for you? She said, oh, yeah, this school is actually really pretty simple. I, in fact, she got A's in all our courses. Because I'm thinking to myself, this college is really hard. And I think the difference between the two of us was I made college hard. Now, don't think for a second she was some kind of loser. She actually enjoyed college a lot. She was the kind of person who could go to a party the night before a test and still do well on a test because at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, she was getting the material in her brain. Everybody's different this way. And I know that for some of us, it's really difficult to fight the part of us that just wants to say, no, I'm going to procrastinate. I'm going to wait till later. But developing good study habits, making them a part of your life, happens because you create routines for yourself. And in that first couple weeks that you're on a college campus, if you can make it methodically the routine that you go to an office hour for a class each week, or that you sit down and review your notes for 30 minutes, and it's there in the same way that eating lunch is a part of your routine or taking a shower is a part of your routine, then after a while it's not so painful.
But if you choose not to do that, and you want to turn off the part of your brain that thinks about that course until the next lecture, I guarantee you that in a course like chemistry or calculus or biology or computer science or any of the science and math courses, you will struggle because our brains just aren't smart enough to be able to do that kind of really challenging learning at the last minute. I get students coming into my office all the time enormously afraid, enormously worried, enormously upset because it isn't all working, it isn't all settled. They realize that they're out of control. And I say to them, you know, your big problem is that you're comparing yourself with all these other people around you instead of looking inside yourself and asking yourself to find ways to achieve those little sorts of victories that occur um, on an hourly or a daily basis that start the process of getting you from where you are now to where you're going to go. Well, this is going to show up in your very first semester in spades three weeks after classes start because three weeks after classes start, you're going to find yourself taking your first series of tests. And it's entirely possible you're going to be in that half of students who get a 56 on their first calculus test or their first chemistry test or something like that. And at that point, that is where you start to make pretty profound decisions in your life about what you're going to be next. So imagine three weeks later you take your next test. And instead of getting that 54, You've done all the things right you need to do to move on a path towards, I don't know, getting a 67, 13 points higher. You know, it's still a D. That person over there is still getting a 92, but you're the one who improved. You're the one who set about the process of figuring out for yourself, you know, how is it that I become a better student? How do I modify my study habits and my study skills? How do I uniquely become what I need to be for me so that my grades can improve? And it may come slow. It may be a 56 that becomes a 72 that becomes an 88 on the final. But you know, that 88 on the final that ultimately, even if it just gets you a C in the course, is your awareness that you've now started to get it right. For some reason, as human beings, so, much, so many of us are afraid. Um, so many of us think that somehow we don't have inside ourselves the, thing, the, the skills, the talents, the strength to do the right thing. So many of us believe that somebody else has figured out how to do it the right way and you need to listen to them. I mean, just think about this. The, the, the process of getting to the place where you're happy with who you are in terms of a career or in terms of a family you might develop, a personal set of relationships you have, that's going to take decades. So is it really sensible for you to think after that 54 on that first test that what you need to do is throw it all away and decide that that isn't right for you? I guarantee you that there is nothing in life that you're going to achieve that really matters that isn't going to have a dozen different times where you utterly fall on your face and have to get up on the other side of it and get better. The way you're going to do that, though, is never, ever going to happen because of the fear that you instill in yourself because you look at somebody else and think they're better than you.